Good morning, everybody. A happy New Year. It's so good to have a new year. I can't think of a better way to start our new year than with our series on the excellence of Jesus. This series is going to cover the most important topic for anybody to think about. Now, I think about this question a lot. Um, If you're like me, then you're asking yourself, who is Jesus? This is the most important question for anybody to ask themselves. This is where it's at. When you stand before God, when you're absent from the body and face to face with the Lord, this is the question that God has for you. Anybody a fan of C.S. Lewis in here? C.S. Lewis, a great author, he wrote this book, Mere Christianity, and he said we only have three options. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what your religion is. You have three options when it comes to Jesus. He wrote here in his book that uh, he would either be, Jesus would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make a choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. And then he adds, you can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. So there's three options for C.S. Lewis. Jesus is either a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord. The scripture that Joel read to us from John, I mean uh, Exodus 3.14, in the Old Testament, God calls himself a name. What is the name? The I am. And the second scripture we had there was John 8.58, which it's, it's talking about that when Jesus says something that that rubs people such the wrong way that they would try, would try to kill him. You know what he says in John 8, 58? He says, before Abraham was, ego a me, I am. So Jesus was equating himself to the God of the Old Testament who says, my name is I am. Tell them I am sent you. And Jesus says, I am. One time he said it and people fell down. Like these guards just got literally fell to the ground. Because he's claiming to be God. So, we have some options here. Either Jesus is telling the truth, and he is God, or he's lying, and then he'd be a liar, or he really thinks he is God, but he's not God, so he's kind of of a loony. You see uh, different types of lunatics all over the world. I grew up in a city called San Clemente, and there was this Japanese Jesus guy who would show up at the San Clemente Pier and give out pizza. He's kind of a lunatic, right? He's not Jesus. The pizza was cool, but, but we, have to, we have to call people out like, hey, you're either telling the truth or you're not. That's a good question. Who is Jesus? The scriptures are pretty clear on who Jesus is. Here's another question. What does Jesus look like? Well, it depends where you are in the world on how he will be portrayed. If you go to, uh, if you go to India, they, they might paint him like a top left-hand corner. Uh, if, if, you, if you go to some parts in Africa, they're going to they're gonna portray him a certain way. In Rome, they'll portray him that way. In Southeast Asia, they might portray him that way. And so on and so forth. But what, what does he look like? I'll tell you what he looks like. Love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's what Jesus looks like. When people are, have the spirit of Christ in them and they show up in a place, you see Jesus. You want to know what Jesus looks like? Check this out. Love. You know what? When Jesus shows up in a place, it looks like my friend David Janicki when he's loving his boys and his wife. You know what joy looks like? It's when, it's when Kylie's baking something or Giselle's drawing art. 
You know what peace looks like? Peace looks like, like Grady Brown flying all the way from North Carolina to minister to military youth and just having total peace about it. And even, even American Airlines losing his luggage and he just has total peace. That's Jesus. Love, joy, peace, patience. You know what patience looks like? It looks like when Jeanette's dealing with, with uh, kids who are struggling or with a husband who's struggling. Kindness. You know what kindness looks like? Kindness looks like when Ryder is dealing with, with neighborhood kids. He's so kind to them. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. You know, you know what goodness looks like? It looks like when, when Jody Bryan puts together a, uh, uh, a, uh, a Christmas Eve service and there's goodness in there. It looks like Rachel Strudel and, and, and her daughter, daughter uh, playing a masterpiece, you know, a, a, a song. There's, there's goodness there. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. You know what faithfulness looks like? It looks like Gudrun walking here from her house every day for, I don't know, over 25, 30 years, something like that. That's faithfulness. You know what gentleness looks like? Well, sometimes I just watch how Pastor Eric talks to people, and I go, that's gentleness. You know what self-control looks like? It looks like when sometimes Kyler is playing with his new toys and he's getting frustrated with it, but he's exercising self-control. That's what Jesus looks like. I, I, we don't want us to get caught up in, was he, was he, that, was he, was he that one, that version? No, it's when, when you show up into a room and you're filled with Jesus, the spirit of Jesus, then people can see exactly what he looks like because they see it in you and in me. So that's what Jesus looks like. Here's another question, because this is such a, this is the, the, the sermon title, okay? This is part one of many sermons leading up to Easter. But uh, the, the, the question is, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus, right? But if I were going to ask who is Jesus, we need to ask what was his mission statement. Did you know Jesus had a mission statement? Jesus had a mission statement. So if you would, open your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 4. And in Luke chapter 4, Jesus, at the outset of his ministry, gives his mission, his mission statement. If you want to know what Jesus is all about, it's in this passage right here. If you want to know what's at the heart of Jesus, it's in Luke chapter 4 at the outset of his ministry. Now, this is a, a military community, so if you want me to get really nerdy right now uh, for, all the, for all the war fighters out there, Jesus is five operational objectives. I pointed out the five verbs in this passage, and they are Jesus' his lines of operation, right? Like I, I said, I'm not a war fighter. I, I'm not allowed to carry a gun. I'm not, a, even in a time of war, in a, in, a, in a hostile environment, I wouldn't even be able to return fire. But I love studying uh, military operations and how military people think, how war fighters think. There's an end state that they're, that they're reaching towards, and there's these uh, objectives, these lines of operation, or these lines of objectives that lead to the end state of peace or security or, or whatever you have it. The end state for Jesus is the kingdom of God here on earth as it is in heaven. Everything Jesus talked about, everything he talked about always pointed back to the kingdom of God. Jesus talked about the kingdom way more than he talked about the local church. I think the word church came out of Jesus' mouth like two or three times, even in the same context. But he was always thinking about the kingdom of God. So if we look at this passage, okay, let, let's read it. Uh, Luke chapter 4, I'm going to begin reading at verses 14, and I'll, I'll keep reading until uh, Jesus finishes his sermon here. It says this, verse 14, Then Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the entire vicinity. He was teaching in their synagogues, being praised by everyone. Verse 16, He came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. As usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. Verse 17, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and on rolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written. And he says this in verse 18. 
The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, or freedom to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, or the broken, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then, watch this, verse 20, and then he rolled up the scroll, and then he gave it back to the attendant, and then he sat down, which means pay attention. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. And then he began by saying to them, Today, as you listen, this scripture has been fulfilled. They were speaking well of him, and they were amazed by the gracious words that came from his mouth. Yet they said, Isn't this Joseph's son? So if you just look at this passage, you remember what happened. The first thing we should ask ourselves is, okay, Jesus said this, he's in Galilee, but where did he just come from? So somebody tell me where Jesus just came from. If you just look down at your Bible, where does it look like he came from? What's the very, what's the very uh, the passage right before this? Yeah, it looks like that, right? I don't know why Luke skips over about five or six months or even upwards every year, but, but, but he does. It looks like he just came out of, the, out of the wilderness, but a lot of ministry has happened up until this point. Uh, by, by the time he gets to Luke 4, and, and by the time he's in Galilee, in his hometown in Nazareth, he had already turned water into wine. That's John chapter 2. He had already cleansed the temple. That's John chapter 2. He had already met the Pharisee. Remember Nicodemus? John 3.16. He had already done that. Remember the woman at the well? When he met him, when he brought his team, and he went through Samaria, when he could have gone around, but he went down to, through Samaria, and he met this woman at the well, and he witnessed to her, and he revealed himself as the Messiah, and she told everybody... That had already happened. And then he goes, there's, there's a lot of things that have happened. If I, I'm tracking Jesus' ministry here. Um, he starts down here, phase one. He begins down here in the, in the, in the south. He's, he's birth, birth or childhood. And then he begins his ministry. And then phase two, he moves over to Judea. Phase three, back up to Galilee. Phase four, goes away from Galilee. Goes west. Goes back down. There's a, there's a private phase here. And then the Passion Week, which is the end of our, our series on Jesus. So a lot has happened here. Okay. Let's go to our passage here. When Jesus goes to the... When he's, when he's given the scroll, um, there's two different, different theories. One theory is that Jesus in his omniscience, because he's God, because he's the great I am, says, give me, give me the scroll, and he opens it, and he just finds where he wants to read. The other theory is that they're sort of like on a, a, a lectionary, and they were on a set schedule, and they give it to him, and they say, Jesus, read from this passage. It doesn't really matter to me which, which theory is true, because Jesus is God. He knows what he wants to say, he knows what the scripture says, and he knows he's going to say it. So, uh, if, if Jesus is in his... In his godness says, you know what, let me just do that scroll, not even going to look, boom, there's the passage. I'm okay with that. Or if they said, this is the schedule we had, the scripture for today, that's even also cool, because Jesus knows exactly what's going to happen. Look at Jesus here, in, when, in verse 14, he returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. He walks into his hometown filled with the Spirit. He is, Ephesians 5.18, drunk in the Spirit. If Jesus got pulled over, he would have got pulled over for a spiritual DUI. That's what Jesus calls us to do, to be drunk in the spirit. Paul said that in Ephesians 5.18, don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the spirit. That means when Jesus walks into his hometown, that means you can tell he's filled with the Holy Spirit. What does it look like when someone's filled with the Holy Spirit? We talked about this, nine things. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is a law. That's what, when, when Jesus walks into to all of these synagogues, when he walks into the room, people go, okay, something's different here. Somebody just walked into the room and they brought these things. This, they brought the fruit of the Spirit. It's the opposite of someone who walks into a room and they have a lot of knowledge and a lot of arrogance. You can also feel that. Have you ever felt that before? Like someone walks into the room and you go, okay, something's not right here. Jesus is the opposite. When he walks into a room, everything changes. 
There's love in the room. There's joy. There's peace. That should be the case when we walk into a room. When we walk into a room and we bring Jesus, people should be able to tell, like, okay, there's something different here. This is cool. And when Jesus takes the mic here, people are excited. They go, you know what? This is something different. And he says here, in, in Luke says here in verse 15, he was teaching in their synagogues and being praised by everyone. They're praising him not because, not because of, uh, of the things he's just saying, because he, uh, he's, he's living it. So he goes back to his hometown, verse 16, where he'd been brought up. Imagine this with me. This, I know what this feels like because I, I just did this a few years ago. I grew up in, in a city, and then I went away. I went away to college, and then I joined the military uh, four years, six years later. And then I joined the military, and then I, I went around for a long time. And then I came back to my hometown in 2019. You know what happened when I came back to my hometown in 2019? Having, I, I graduated high school in, in the late 90s, and I came back. People were like, dude, Ryan, you're a pastor now? That's so cool, because they knew me as a little kid. So they see me 25 years later. They go, dude, where are, you, are you preaching soon? Where are you, where are you preaching? I want to be there when you preach. So I said, yeah, I'm at this church called uh, Heritage Christian Fellowship. It's now called Paradigm, and I'm, I'm going to be there on Sunday. Guess what all my friends and family did? They showed up. When Jesus comes back, he's been gone for a long time. What do you think people said? I mean, what kind of kid was Jesus? What kind of teenager was he? Probably, probably really cool and attractive. Just his personality. Uh, his... So when they came, I can imagine him walking to a city, and they go, Jesus, you're back. Let's play. You know, his old friends, let's play this game. Let's do that. Let's, let's get together. When can you come to my house? Hey, when are you preaching next? And Jesus says, I'll be at the synagogue in Nazareth at this time, and I'm going to read. It's going to be good. Trust me. It's going to be good. <laughs> you want to hear this sermon. So Jesus gets up there, and he reads, and then the scroll is handed to him, and he says this, the spirit of the Lord is on me. Imagine, imagine this. In Jesus' mind, he knows he's reading from, from Isaiah. He's reading from Isaiah 61, verse 2. Jews have been waiting thousands of years for this passage to come true. So when Jesus opens the Bible, I don't know if he had a smirk on his face or when he gets his scroll, but he's like, this is it. Every, this is crazy. I'm going to read a passage right now that everybody's been waiting. They've been dying for this to become true. And it's about to happen. So he starts reading, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You know how long it took Jesus to read this? I counted. Probably 20 seconds. His scripture reading was 20 seconds. His sermon was 50 seconds. Way shorter than anything we do here. When Jesus is reading, let's, let's, I've put this parallel up here. I want you to have your Bibles in front of you, okay? Because I show this, oops, I show this passage. So if you can turn to Isaiah, turn to Isaiah 61, verse 2. This is the passage. When Jesus reads this passage, he's, he's supposed to read from verse 2, and they're waiting for him to read in verse 3 as well. So verse 3 in Isaiah 61, 3 says, beyond the, um, to proclaim the year of our Lord's favor, if Jesus keeps reading, it says this, and the day of our God's vengeance to comfort and, uh, all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, festive oil instead of mourning, and splendid clothes instead of despair. I can imagine the religious leaders, when Jesus is reading this passage, when he's reading the scroll, and Jesus all of a sudden closes the scroll, I can imagine the religious leaders going, hey, 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 what are you doing? You're supposed to keep reading. Why did you stop? That's strike one, Jesus. Why did you stop? And so why did Jesus stop? Well, he stopped reading at verse 2 in Isaiah because, because this, hasn't, this hasn't happened yet. The day of God's vengeance. If he stops reading right here to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, 
then he can say, the next verse, he can say, today this has, become, this has come true. He can't read this part yet because that hasn't come true yet. That's at his second coming. That's at second advent. That is a different time. So they catch it and they go, Jesus, why, why, did, you, why did you do that? Okay? And then he, he, he keeps, he rolls up the scroll, and then this is a mic drop moment, right? A mic drop moment is he goes, today the scripture has been fulfilled. And then he starts telling a story later on about two non-Jews who were healed. And everybody starts to key in on this. They go, wait a minute. He just told us two stories of people who were not Jewish, but God gave them favor. And they got super upset. They got super mad. Why would anybody get upset if someone from a different ethnic background is getting favor from the Lord? Why would they do that? Well, maybe they're racist. Maybe they say, no, 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 God only loves our kind. And when Jesus is saying, no, let me tell you a story, God's going to love everybody, and he's revealing to them their own hearts, their own racism, and their own, their hearts are off. And then that's when they try to kill him. But if they were paying attention, they would catch what Jesus is doing here. They would catch what Jesus is all about. They would catch his, his mission statement. I want to show you here, what I do in my Bible is every time I see a verb, if you look at my Bible here, if you look at my Bible, all, my, all the major verbs, all the verbs are, I put a box around them. Because when God wants to tell you to do something, he always does it by giving you a verb, an action word. So here, I put a box around all the verbs. Jesus, the first thing Jesus comes to do is to preach good news to the poor. The second thing he does, so that's preaching good news to the poor, Second thing he does is to proclaim release to the captives. Okay, so you have the poor here. We're going to figure out what that is. And then you have the captives. And then the third verb is he wants to give blind people sight again. They, used, they were blind, but now they see. Okay. The fourth thing Jesus wants to do is to set free people who are held captive or oppressed or, or pushed down. Lastly, he wants to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. We have to see what that is as well. In the end state, remember this. When Jesus does all of these things, these five operational lines, these four major verbs, it's always to do this. Kingdom living, here on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus cares about the kingdom. Okay, so if you look at the same passage here, there's, I have different categories of people. So the first category would be uh, those who are in spiritual poverty, the, the low in spirit. These are people who are in, humble, in a humble condition. They have ears to hear. The second people here would be people who are it's in, in bondage, so people who are addicted to things. And addiction, addiction doesn't necessarily mean drugs or your phone. It could also mean things that are good, like work, it can mean things like church. It can mean things like ministry. We can become addicts of everything. John Calvin said our hearts are like idol factories. Our heart wants to worship anything and everything that's not God. That's called idolatry. We have to guard our hearts from those things. And Jesus comes to set those uh, people free. Okay. Uh, spiritual the spiritually wounded, uh, people who have wounds, people who are dealing with things and wounds from the past, and then forgiveness and renewal. He wants to proclaim the, the year of the Lord's favor, which is all about forgiveness and renewal. When we'll, we'll get to that. Okay, so when we let's break down each word here so we know exactly what Jesus is talking about. Uh, what, to preach good news to the poor, this is the word. I'm going to show you the original words that, the, that Jesus is using here the original words that Luke was writing when he, when he wrote these things, the Greek word for, for preaching good news is, comes from the word euangelizo. Eu meaning good. Euangelizo means to pr proclaim the good news to these people called the poor. Uh, when you proclaim good news to the poor, uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, you're proclaiming good news to those two people who, who have ears to hear. If you're proclaiming good news, 
just know this. You can never have good news without some bad news. You can't have hot without cold. You can't have light without darkness. You can't have fast without slow. So all those examples, just to say, you have no good news to share unless there's a lot of bad news. You know what the bad news is? The bad news is, well, just think about your own life. Think about, well, like what I write in my journal, there's a lot of bad news in my journal. Like I write my struggles there. I write my addictions there. I write everything there, and it reminds me, it enables me to preach the gospel to myself when I see all the bad news in my life. So Jesus comes to bring good news. Jesus also proclaims release to the captives. The, the word for here to proclaim is the same thing. It's, it's preaching. You know where the captives are? Well, the captives here in this, in this passage, it comes from uh, different, two different words. Eichme, which is spear, and halitos, which is taken. So it's literally someone who's taken captive at spear point or at gunpoint. It's an allusion to Israel in their bondage. But when we talk about bondage, when we talk about captivity, I, I talked about this before, where, where, where people can be held captive by anything, anything and everything. The world calls these things addictions, but, but we would call it bondage. And just a, a small plug, we have bought books for everybody. One of my favorite books is about freedom from bondage. And that might be another series later on, but we, got, we, have, we bought books for everybody to, to have on how to break free from spiritual bondage. When Jesus arrives on earth, he's looking around, he's going, okay, all right, I see some bondage here and there. I came so that everybody can experience freedom from every single addiction, every single bondage. That's why Jesus came. Jesus is a chain breaker. Have you heard that song? by Zach Williams, chain breaker. That's what Jesus is, okay? Recovery of sight to the blind. Well, who's blind? Who's blind? People who can't see. That's who's blind. But when Jesus is talking about things, he's not always talking about physical, literal things. Sometimes, most of the time, he's talking about something eternal and something spiritual. So who are the spiritually blind? Maybe it's people who, who can't see their own spiritual um, need. Maybe it's people who know a lot about the Bible, but they don't really know God. Maybe, maybe it's about people who are insincere, but, they, but they're spiritually blind. Jesus came so that people can see clearly. He wants people to see God clearly so that they can see others clearly, so that they can see themselves clearly. Because if I see myself clearly, then I can see everybody else clearly. But I can't see myself clearly unless I see myself through the lens of God. And so that's what Jesus came to do. Jesus came so that everybody can see around, look around, and, and nobody's confused anymore. Like when I look at people, when I look at myself, and I see my own brokenness, and I see my own struggles, I don't go like, oh, why, why, why am I like that now? Because God, God has given me spiritual sight. I can go, I know why people act like that, because they need a Savior. And I know why I act like that, because I need a Savior. So I can see now, and it's no longer confusing. A lot of people who are confused is because they have spiritual blindness. And they would look at the news, and they would say, well, why do people act like that? We're not confused about how broken the world is. When celebrities fall, when politicians fall, the world is shocked. As Christians, we're not shocked when people fall, because we know everybody needs a savior. Right? If if a president or if a pastor or if anybody makes the front news of the newspaper, the world will always be shocked. We're not shocked. We're never shocked because everybody is in need of a savior because we have spiritual sight. Does that make sense? Let's never be shocked again when we see ourselves sin or when we see others sin, when we see our brothers sin against us, our sisters, our moms, our dads, our uncles. Let's never be shocked again with each other's sin because we know now, we know that Jesus came because everybody needs him. So the blind here, uh, we have the oppressed. Who are the oppressed? To set free the oppressed. Well, these people who are oppressed, the, the Greek word here is thrao, uh, people who are shattered and broken. These are people who have wounds. Everybody has wounds. You only have to be alive for a little bit to know that you have some wounds. And to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. 
when Jesus talks about the year of the Lord's favor, he's quoting, well, he's quoting Isaiah 61, right? But Isaiah 61 is quoting Leviticus 25, verse 10. Really quick, I just want to tell you what Leviticus 25, verse 10 is. Leviticus 25, verse 10 talks about the year of the Lord's favor or the year of Jubilee. You know what this is? It's every 50 years in Israel, it was a time where people were released from their debts. Does any, you don't have to raise your hand here. How many of you have debts? Imagine at the 50-year mark, all of our debts were free because whoever you owed money to, they cut you loose. Slaves were freed at this time. Um, land was given rest because they knew that if, if you work the land too much, it stops producing fruit. So the year of Jubilee was a year where, imagine this, Imagine in this room, right, if it's the year of Jubilee, and, and whatever anybody owed you in here, you just cut them loose. You cancel their debt. That's what Jesus brings. That's the year of the Lord's favor, Leviticus 25. Okay. All right, here, here's, here's Jesus' mission in a nutshell. He comes to preach good news, good news to the captives. He comes to give blind people's sight. He comes to bring freedom for all those who are hurting. And he comes to bring um, forgiveness. If you look at the theme of Jesus' life, it's always this. Freedom from this. Freedom from this. Freedom from this. Forgiveness for this. Forgiveness for this. There's two themes in Jesus' life that ring true. Freedom and forgiveness. Jesus is a freedom fighter. Uh, when you walked in, you should have received a bulletin. I want you like you to open that at, at this time. And there's a handout in there. So let's let's do this, friends and family. How about we start off 2023 with writing our own mission? So, and you don't have to do this now, but I want you to take this serious because if you don't have a life mission, if you don't have a target. There's a saying, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. So you'll live every day like, why why do I exist? And it would also behoove you if you aligned your mission statement with Jesus' mission. How do we create a a, a Christ-centered mission? Well, I I put a few things there. One, who are you? What's your identity? Are Are you a son? Are you a daughter? Are you a husband? Are you a wife? Are you a brother? You, you list who you are. And then what is, what is your goal? Or what is his goal, actually? What is God's goal for all of people? And I've just posted some things up here. Jesus is all about freedom. And he's all about forgiveness. So in your mission statement, as you think about 2023, weave this into there. Weave this into there. Something about helping people get free helping people get forgiveness. And who's your audience? Who has God God called you to? God has called me specifically to this community in this uniform, in this, and you have your own mission. If 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 you're at Patch Elementary School here, that's where God has you right now. If you're at Panzer High School, Stuttgart High School, that's where God has you. If you're at UCOM, that's where God, that's your, that's where God wants you to shine. If you're at Africa, that's where God wants you to shine. If you're in Garrison, God has us all in different places, different likes, different genres. There's some people here that are into into classical music. There's some people here that are into punk rock music. We need Christians in every venue. We need Christians in every place. We need Christian janitors. We need Christian nurses. We need Christian teachers. We need Christians in all different places, and we all have a different mission. Jesus is all about freedom. I, I like this. This is one of my favorite verses about freedom. 2 Corinthians 3.17, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And when we think about our own freedom, like how can I tell others about freedom when I have my own struggles, when I still struggle with this, when I still do this, when I, I'm still ensnared by this, I want you to just look at this verse. Because this verse tells us where freedom is. It's wherever the Spirit of the Lord is. There is freedom. So we might not always feel like we're free because of the things that we do when no one's looking. But where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Here's what freedom is. 
Freedom is, is not the absence of something in our lives, but it's about the presence of someone. So if you are a believer in Jesus, you have the Spirit of Christ, you're free. You are free, and you're able to jump in on Jesus' mission of being free. So as, as, you, as, you, uh, as you draft your mission, we're going to go into a time of, of communion, and then we'll sing a song. And I want you to use this time to reflect. Reflect on who Jesus is. Jesus is a, is, is a man on a mission. He's the great I am. But he, he came to do a few things. And then look at our lives and let us in 2023, imagine if this was the year. Imagine if 2023 was a year of Jubilee where you forgave everybody for everything they've ever done every single day. Imagine how freeing that would be.